Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're really digging into something absolutely central to nursing practice, the idea of caring in nursing practice. Our main source is the 11th edition of Fundamentals of Nursing by Potter, Perry, Stockert, and Hall, uh, a text many of you are probably very familiar with. This deep dive is crafted specifically for you as college level nursing students. We wanna give you a clear, engaging, and importantly, practical understanding of why caring is, well, it's not just a soft skill, it's truly a vital professional requirement. We'll explore how this understanding is critical for your success in actual healthcare settings and, yep, even for hitting those NCLEX competencies. Okay, let's unpack this. That's a great way to put it, unpack. Because caring is so much more than just, you know, being friendly. It's really foundational. It influences pretty much everything. Patient satisfaction, definitely. But also safety, your clinical judgment, um, even tough ethical calls. And what's really interesting, I think, is that even with all the amazing technology we have now in healthcare, that basic human connection, that act of genuine caring, it's still paramount. It's what makes nursing truly excellent. That difference is key. So to really get a handle on what caring means in this context, let's try a thought experiment from the book. Picture two nurse-patient interactions. They take about the same amount of time. Okay, scenario one. Nurse comes in, warm greeting, makes eye contact, actually sits down for a minute, asks about the patient's thoughts, their concerns, really listens, then does a quick exam, checks vitals. Scenario two, different nurse. Enters, looks at the IV, checks vitals, acknowledges the patient, but uh, doesn't sit, doesn't touch, makes eye contact sort of from above, asks a few quick questions, and then leaves. See, the time spent is similar, but that first nurse, they demonstrate profound caring. It's about presence, empathy, and that approach, it encourages patients to open up, to share more about what they're really experiencing. This deeper understanding, well, it directly helps the nurse make better clinical judgments, better decisions which in turn impacts patient satisfaction and, you know, ultimately their health outcomes. It really shows how just being there makes a huge difference. Absolutely. It highlights that caring isn't simple. It's complex, multi-layered, and it truly forms the foundation of that crucial nurse-patient relationship. But, and this is a big but, we're dealing with a modern paradox here. Right. Today's healthcare environment is, well, it's hectic. It's high tech, often driven by productivity metrics, efficiency targets, and sometimes that environment can actually threaten our capacity for real caring, for compassion. You definitely feel that pressure sometimes. The time constraints, the workload, it can make establishing those therapeutic relationships feel, well, challenging. Exactly. And that's why focusing on a patient-centered approach is so vital. It has to be rooted in sincerity and active listening, genuine presence, respect, uh, acceptance. This is what can really transform healthcare delivery and improve outcomes. You see major nursing organizations like the ANA, the RWJF, constantly stressing that caring and knowledge are the core of nursing. They often show this visually, like in Figure 7.1 in the text, placing caring and knowledge right at the center of everything, safety, quality, managing care. That's a perfect bridge to talking about the theories behind caring. Nursing has this rich history of exploring caring from different philosophical, ethical angles. It's seen as a universal human thing, really. Right. And no matter the specific theory, the common thread is that caring allows nurses to work respectfully and therapeutically with all patients. Take Dr. Patricia Benner. Her concept, caring is primary, came from studying expert nurses, listening to their stories. She defines caring as the essence of excellent nursing practice. For Benner, caring means that people, events, things, they genuinely matter. There's this powerful idea she has. Caring creates possibility. It suggests empathy itself can open doors to healing. And research shows nursing students, like yourselves, consistently identify caring as absolutely essential. Then you have Madeline Leininger offering a transcultural perspective. She argues that care is what really distinguishes nursing from other fields. It's an essential human need, focused on improving the human condition, which is different from just cure. Yeah, and Leininger's key insight is that, while the need for care is universal, how it's expressed varies hugely across cultures. This means, for you as nurses, it's incredibly important to learn um, culturally specific ways people show and expect care. Think about Box 7.1 in the text. It guides you to actively gather a cultural-based history. This involves things like asking about health beliefs, understanding end-of-life preferences within their cultural context, identifying family or community resources that are important to them, really being curious about how their culture shapes their experience. Another major figure is Jean Watson. Her transpersonal caring theory puts caring right at the center, aiming to preserve the profession's ethical and philosophical roots, especially, you know, in a healthcare system that can sometimes feel dehumanizing. Watson's model is very holistic. 
It blends human caring with creating healing environments. She talks about carative behaviors and the conscious intention to care. Importantly, she says her model rejects the disease orientation and explicitly places care before cure. It encourages you to see your role as fostering a healing relationship, not just treating symptoms. She outlines 10 carative factors. Table 7.1 describes these. Let me give a couple of examples. Factor 1, forming a human altruistic value system might mean using appropriate self-disclosure to build rapport. Or Factor 3, cultivating a sensitivity to oneself and to others involves your own self-awareness as a nurse. Factor 7, promoting transpersonal teaching learning is about empowering patients with self-care knowledge. It's a transformative model because Watson believes the caring relationship influences both the nurse and the patient, fostering deeper healing for everyone involved. And we also have Kristen Swanson's theory of caring. This came out of her research directly with patients and caregivers, which gives it a really grounded feel. She defines caring as a nurturing way of relating, stressing personal commitment and responsibility. Swanson gives us five clear caring processes. These are detailed in Table 7.2 and are super practical. First is knowing. Really trying to understand the patient's experience, avoiding assumptions, assessing thoroughly, looking for clues, then being with. Being emotionally present, physically available, sharing feelings appropriately, not burdening them. Mm -hmm. Doing for. Acting for the patient as you would for yourself, comforting, anticipating needs, performing skills gently, protecting dignity. Fourth is enabling, helping patients navigate transitions by informing, supporting, generating alternative, validating their feelings. And finally, maintaining belief, sustaining faith in their ability to cope, offering realistic hope, really going the distance with them. Studies show this theory helps improve patient satisfaction and actually builds confidence in new nurses because it provides concrete ways to demonstrate care. So when you look at all these theories, Benner, Leininger, Watson, Swanson, you see these common themes emerging, right? human interaction, mutual respect, seeing the patient as unique, and ultimately aiming to improve their well-being. Caring is fundamentally relational. And, you know, when it's done well, it can almost seem invisible, just a natural part of the interaction. But boy, is it obvious when it's missing. Like that story Benner tells of the patient who just knew the nurse was going through the motions. You can feel the absence of genuine care. That brings up a really practical point. <laughs> How do we apply this? A key part of caring is what Swanson calls enabling. This means working with patients, not just on them, helping them identify options, find resources, basically acting as their advocate. Think about a patient newly diagnosed with diabetes. Enabling isn't just handing them a diet sheet. It's uh, helping them figure out how to fit lifestyle changes into their life, maybe timing medication around their work schedule or finding exercises they might actually enjoy. It's collaborative problem solving. And you absolutely can't do that without understanding the context of a person's life and illness, as the book says. You need to know who they are, how they see their illness. Asking those key questions, how did you first notice this illness? How do you feel about it? How does it affect your day-to-day -day life? That insight is what leads to truly personalized and, frankly, more successful care plans. And when you look at what patients themselves value, research is pretty consistent. Yes, they want competent task performance, but they equally value that effective side, the art of nursing. Hmm. Things like feeling the nurse is helping them solve problems together, offering reassurance, showing basic human respect by listening and accepting them without judgment. They want to feel you get what's important to them and that you're trying to create a comfortable healing space. There are even tools designed to measure this from the patient's viewpoint, like the caring assessment tool, the CIT. Box 7.3 in the text breaks down its factors. Yeah, the ATC looks at things like mutual problem solving. Does the nurse help me understand my thinking? Attentive reassurance. Does the nurse support my sense of hope? Human respect. Does the nurse listen, accept me? It covers encouraging manner, appreciation of unique meanings, healing environment, affiliation needs like involving family, and meeting basic human needs like reducing worry. And the evidence, summarized nicely in Box 7.2 on enhancing caring, is really strong. There's a clear positive link between these kinds of nurse caring behaviors and patient satisfaction. Listening, presence, they consistently lead to better satisfaction and improved outcomes. And like we hinted at earlier, it benefits us as nurses too. Engaging in caring behaviors is linked to higher job satisfaction and reduced stress and burnout. Studies highlighted in Table 7.3, like those focusing on cancer patients or learning patient stories, all reinforce the power of knowing your patient, listening, and just being present. Right. Becoming that caring professional, it's definitely a journey. It's something you learn and refine through every single interaction. And it's guided by what we call an ethic of care. 
This means consciously placing caring at the heart of your decision making. It's about creating an atmosphere of mutual respect and trust. It's like a professional ethical promise you make. This ethic makes nurses such powerful advocates for patients, especially when there's an imbalance of power, maybe due to the illness itself or lack of information or just pain and fear. Okay, here's something to think about, that reflect now scenario in the book. A patient needs a lot of care, constantly using the call bell, and you hear staff saying things like, oh, I just answered it, or it's your turn. How do those comments impact the ethic of care we're discussing? And maybe more importantly, how would you address that with your colleagues? It really forces you to consider those daily ethical moments. Another huge part of this is providing presence. It's more than just being physically in the room. It's that person-to-person -person connection that conveys closeness, a sense of caring. It involves both being there the physical presence, the communication, the understanding and being with, which is about truly giving of yourself, being available, stepping into the patient's world for a moment. Presence is so powerful for patient-centered care. It can reduce that awful feeling of isolation, help diminish fear or anxiety, and just provide reassurance. You convey it through eye contact, body language, your tone of voice, active listening, and maintaining a positive, hopeful attitude. It's especially vital during really stressful times for patients waiting for test results, getting ready for surgery. Then there's touch. Touch can be incredibly comforting, but this is also deeply personal and relational. We need to differentiate types of touch. There's contact touch, actual skin to skin. This includes task oriented touch, performing a procedure skillfully and gently, maybe explaining as you go, talking quietly. Think about inserting an NG tube, doing it efficiently, but also kindly. And there's caring touch, which is nonverbal communication, holding a hand, a gentle back rub, carefully repositioning someone. These convey comfort, security, value. We also have protective touch, like grabbing someone's arm to prevent a fall. And then there's therapeutic touch, or TT, which is actually a specific holistic complementary therapy. It involves using your hands intentionally to help balance the patient's energy field. There's evidence that can help with anxiety and pain. But, and this is really, really important, always use touch thoughtfully. You must be sensitive to cultural differences and the patient's personal history or trauma. Never assume touch is welcome. The rule is always ask or inform the patient first. Listening. This sounds simple, but true listening is a planned, deliberate act. It means being fully present, setting aside judgment, and actively engaging with what the patient is saying and not saying. It involves truly taking in the information, interpreting it, understanding the meaning behind the words, and then reflecting that understanding back. It's fundamental to building that mutual relationship. Yeah, real listening is how you get to know what truly matters to the patient. It's incredibly important, especially in difficult situations like end-of-life care. It means silencing your own internal chatter, concentrating fully, and paying attention not just to the words, but the tone, the pauses, the body language, really hearing their story. Which leads directly to knowing the patient. This is something that happens instantly. It's a complex process that develops over time within the nurse-patient relationship, and it's strongly linked to patient satisfaction and better outcomes. It's about having an in-depth understanding of how this particular patient responds to illness, to treatments, and understanding who they are as a whole person beyond their diagnosis. This connects right back to Swanson's theory, doesn't it? That knowing process. And it's absolutely vital for sharp clinical decision making. Knowing your patient helps you interpret subtle cues, anticipate needs, and tailor care effectively using evidence-based practice. Exactly. Things like having continuity of care, seeing the same patient over time, clinical expertise, teamwork, trust, and simply spending enough time these all help you know the patient. Conversely, barriers like fragmented care, really short hospital stays or system pressures, these can prevent nurses from truly knowing their patients. And that unfortunately can lead to poorer outcomes, things like falls or maybe incorrect discharge teaching. You see with experienced nurses, they develop this almost intuitive sense and ability to detect subtle changes almost effortlessly. That's often the hallmark of really knowing their patients. The book also touches on spiritual caring. This relates to helping patients find meaning and maintain a balance between their values, goals, and beliefs, especially during illness. Right. Spiritual caring is about fostering interconnectedness within the person, interpersonal, between people, interpersonal, and with a higher power, or the universe, transpersonal. Watson talks about this a lot, mobilizing hope, helping patients find meaning in their illness experience, connecting with them, human to human, spirit to spirit. It's about recognizing and supporting that spiritual dimension of healing. 
And then there's relieving symptoms and suffering. This is more than just giving pain meds, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It involves thoughtful, patient-centered caring actions aimed at providing comfort, preserving dignity and respect, and promoting peace. And this care often extends to the patient's family and friends, too. Knowing the patient, understanding what their symptoms mean to them, guides how we approach relief. A quiet presence, gentle touch, active listening, these help us assess suffering and work with the patient to set goals for relief. We have to address suffering in all its forms, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, often just by being there, listening without judgment. Finally, the text emphasizes family care. Caring for an individual inherently involves caring for their family. They're often a crucial resource, as Figure 7.2 illustrates. Definitely. How involved the family is, their willingness to share information, their acceptance of treatments, these all influence our nursing interventions. Box 7.4 gives some great examples of caring behaviors as perceived by families, especially in challenging situations like cancer care. Things like being honest, listening to their concerns too, helping with tough decisions like advanced directives, advocating for the patient, keeping them informed, involving them in care, and also providing simple comforts, offering a warm blanket, helping the patient with self-care when they can't manage these things mean a lot to families. So let's bring this together with another scenario from the book, Building Competency in Patient-Centered Care. Think about Mrs. Martinez, 72, usually independent, lives with her son. She's experiencing lightheadedness, but is scared to tell her doctor because she fears losing her independence. Okay, knowing her situation, her values around independence, her symptoms, how do, as the nurse, approach planning and implementing patient-centered care for her? It really makes you think about integrating all these caring concepts. It's clear that this deep desire to care is what draws many people into nursing. And it provides incredible satisfaction when you can truly connect and make a difference. But we have to acknowledge the challenges in today's system. Less time at the bedside, maybe an over-reliance on technology sometimes, the constant pressure for cost-effectiveness. Mm. These things can, and sometimes do, undermine genuine caring. And this can lead to what's known as compassion fatigue. Nurses feel torn between wanting to provide that deep human care and just needing to get through the tasks demanded by the system. The good news is that professional organizations, the ANA, NLN, AOEN, AACN, and major initiatives like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Future of Nursing campaign are actively working on this. They're pushing for better staffing, more nurse autonomy, improved education, all aimed at strengthening that nurse-patient interaction. Ultimately, though, making care a true cornerstone of healthcare requires a dual commitment. Institutions need to embed caring into their philosophy, their policies, their environment. And individual nurses like you need to commit to intentionally building those relationships that allow for personal, competent, compassionate, and meaningful nursing care. It echoes Watson's words. Nursing is a lifetime journey of caring and healing, seeking to understand and preserve the wholeness of human existence and to offer compassionate, informed, knowledgeable human caring. That's such a powerful way to frame it. We've covered a lot today, really unpacking how caring isn't just peripheral. It's the absolute foundation of nursing practice. Yeah. It shapes everything from how patients feel to the clinical decisions you make. It's not just a soft skill. It's a core professional imperative impacting every single encounter. So here's a final thought to take with you as you move forward in your studies and into your practice. Consider how deliberately practicing just one specific caring behavior each day maybe focusing on truly listening one day or being consciously present the next, how that small act could transform not only a patient's experience, but also enrich your own sense of purpose and satisfaction as a nurse. What small act of caring will you choose to prioritize today? Thank you so much for joining us for this deep dive into the heart of nursing caring practice. Keep exploring these vital concepts, keep practicing them, and we'll catch you on the next one.